Welcome to Firefighting Today, the weekly video roundtable discussion show where we discuss all things fire service related. Firefighting Today is a production of PeteLamb.com. And now your host, Chief Peter Lamb. Well, good evening. It's nice to uh, nice to be back with you. We got the uh, panel assembled and we're, uh, we're back in action here. So that's a good thing. Um, for those folks that happen to be watching us live on YouTube, um, if, you, uh, if you are watching us live, you can interact with us using the live chat. So use the live chat feature on YouTube. We can bring your questions right into the panel and, uh, and get that done for you. And secondly, if you happen to be on uh, Twitter, uh, if you've got something, we're, we're monitoring Twitter, but it is a little bit uh, tougher for us to monitor Twitter, but we are uh, watching the Twitter. So if you do at Pete Lamb, uh, we will try to get that in for you. So tonight we're talking about minimum manpower, what can be done, those kinds of things, what happens when you wait for mutual aid and all of those ancillary things that go with this. But let's introduce the panel first and uh, we'll have everybody just say hello. So uh, Chief Whitley, say hello, please. Good evening, Warren Whitley, uh, retired assistant chief from Prince William County in Virginia, growing my Washington Capitals playoff beard and also a member of Kill the Flashover. Okay, thanks, Warren. I appreciate it. Uh, Chief Fling. Good evening, everybody. Hey, Chief Lamb. Thanks for having me. I'm Rob Fling. I'm a past chief with the Dixels Fire Department on Long Island, and glad to be here. All right, perfect. Um, Robbie Owens, Captain. Hey, everybody. My name is Robbie Owens. I'm a captain within Record County Division of Fire in Virginia, located just outside of the uh, city of Richmond. Glad to be back uh, on the Firefighting Today Roundtable. Always a pleasure to have you, Robbie. And uh, Deputy LaPierre, say hello. Introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Lou LaPierre, Deputy Chief in the town of Smithfield. Uh, and today is my 33rd anniversary of being a fireman. Wonderful. Now that is that is a good milestone. That's a good one. Uh, great, great. To and good why fire. are you spending it with us? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chief Cagno, say hello. Hi, uh, John Cagno, retired, retired Chief Fire North Providence, and uh, it's nice to have the panel back together again. As, as Warren says, the band is back together. And Chief Pernesti, last but certainly not least. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Joe Pernesti. I'm with the City of Elyria, Ohio Fire Department, Northern Ohio. I'm an assistant chief there, and I'm glad to be back on a Sunday night with you guys. We appreciate it. We appreciate it. Uh, this, this panel means nothing without these uh, panelists and certainly the people that are watching. Uh, we, do have, uh, we do have some viewers, so if you're in the chat room, just say hello. Just pop up and say hello. Uh, we've got another panelist joining right as we speak, so let me just see if I can squeak. Uh, uh, Don, Don, are you with us? Don's having some technical issues, so we're going to go by him for the moment, and uh, we'll get started. So we're talking about minimum manpower. We're talking about um, a bunch of stuff. Uh, there, there is a, a bunch of places we could go with this, but it was interesting when I put the um, when I put the tweet out for the show. Uh, someone tweeted back and said something to the effect, and I'm paraphrasing here, but the the point was. I'm not sure why we're even having this discussion. We have standards and we have, we know what it takes. You know, why are we having this discussion or something to that effect? Now, there could have been any number of things that they meant by that, but they signed their name and it was, a, I, I, in fact, retweeted it. I think a variety of opinions are, are good, but I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to just run the panel. Is the minimum manpower question, um, is it worth talking about? Or, or should we just say that, listen, the NFPA standard 1710 says 17 to 22 people, 2,000 square foot dwelling, blah, 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 or infinitum. Uh, Chief Whitley, why don't, you, uh, why don't you start with your thoughts? Um, I'm, I'm not sure where you were headed tonight, but let's just have the panel comment on, is it worth having the minimum manpower discussion? I think so, and the, the context I was looking at when I suggested this is 
um, addressing those areas where they, they may show up with two guys because that's all that's going to show up for 10 or 15 minutes because they're a volunteer department, maybe a rural area, and they have to wait on the help to get there. So I was thinking, of, well, what can they be doing productive in that, you know, that zero impact period until they're getting more help on, on the scene? Yeah, so I, I and I think that is very valiant. You know, sometimes we sometimes we forget how the other half lives. You know, 74, 75% of America is volunteer combination departments on call departments and there's even small you know urban departments. I listen, I was a career department that I just came from and and we were running with eight people. So, you know, it there are you know, what, what is the, the saying? I think I said it on the podcast today was, you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, Rob, you come from the volunteer sector. Uh, is, is the minimum manpower discussion worth having? Absolutely. Um, as a matter of fact, I was doing bailout training this morning and we were having a little impromptu discussion about the train. Uh, we're going to open our training building again for the season in a couple of weeks. And we were talking about drills. And one of the drills we were talking about having is having that first and second do engine show up short because during the day, that's probably exactly what's going to happen. So your response is, is night and day, right? Daytime is obviously tougher yeah. to get that. To you know, get that I, I can tell you for a fact that my first due engine during the day is going to show up with two guys. Why? Because they're two district employees and they're out the door as soon as the tones drop. They're going to get there and they're going to have to do what they have to do until the cavalry shows up. The cavalry's coming, but it's going to take them a few minutes to get there. Yep. No, good point. Um, Robbie, you're in a much bigger system, but but how does um, – is the discussion worth having, I guess? Before we get started in the nuts and bolts, uh, is the discussion worth having? Uh, absolutely. It, it's it's worth having from a multitude of different things. Uh, just because I come from currently a large, what I would call suburban fire department, uh, we still have minimum staffing on our fire engines. We ride only with – and ladder trucks and, and suppression pieces, we only ride with three. Before I got hired in the department that I work for, I worked in a department where it was two people on shift and you cross staffed an engine and ambulance and also worked part time for a department where you did the same thing. So you showed up with, you know, maybe two people. And if you were all on an EMS call, you had to race back from the hospital to get uh, to the fire truck. So it's nice to have all these NFPA standards and 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 you know, NIST did a manpower study and that's but that's not reality of what's really out there. So the manpower study or so the manpower discussion has to happen uh, for each individual fire department. Yeah, I think that's a good point that, you know, somewhere during this discussion, I think we're going to talk about the individuality of this because I do think that that matters. I think that's a real big deal. Uh, Lou, what are your thoughts on, uh, you know, is, is the discussion, uh, is the discussion worth having and then we'll take it in whatever direction we want to. Oh, absolutely. Um, just dialogue. Just having dialogue creates awareness um, and awareness of the various scenarios. And, you know, you could be in a department that, that doesn't have minimum manpower issues, but there's going to be that one scenario where you're going to have, you know, your, 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 your next new engine company is going to be 10 minutes out. And then what do you do then? Right. And hopefully you talked about it before it happens. Right, right, absolutely. Chief Cagno, your thoughts on the uh, minimum manpower discussion? Yeah, it's uh, an absolute need to, to to have this discussion, especially uh, when we're thinking about you know setting expectations as to what we can efficiently pull off on the fire ground when we're understaffed. Makes sense, Chief Pernesti. Your thoughts? Uh, absolutely. I I, I heard um, I was in a class, and the one firefighter from a department that only has four guys on duty said that. His department's like a football team that in the first quarter uh, plays with uh, seven football players. In the second quarter, they get nine. Then they get third, you know, 10 in the third quarter. And then finally in the fourth quarter, they get enough people to play the football game, but they're behind. And I thought, man, that really stuck with me. And, I, you know, you can say all the standards you want, but you know what? We're going to show up with people and not enough people. All of our departments will. And uh, like uh, Chief Warren said, it's about what 
the, the, the departments that are able to do things with uh, two or three people that make a difference and to, and to do it safely and effectively with the smart tactics. That's yeah, and we'll, uh, we'll get into the meat of the matter. I think Don has rejoined us. Um, uh, Captain Tebow, are you with us? I think I am. am All I? right. Yes, yes, you are. Um, so that's, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, why don't you just do a real quick uh, introduction of yourself, uh, Don, because we didn't get you on the front end of this. So just tell the audience uh, who you are, and then we'll, uh, we'll get you in the discussion. Uh, good evening. My name is Don Tebow. I'm a 17-year veteran of the Mansfield Fire Department, uh, where I currently serve as a shift commander captain uh, as well. All right, perfect. So the question that we just posed to the panel, uh, nice, nice to just jump in and when I when I'm throwing questions out. But um, is this discussion about minimum manpower worth the discussion, or should we just be, you know, uh, doing what the national standards tell us to do? Well, I think that uh, the national standards are, you know, as you mentioned out uh, earlier, we, we all know what NFPA stands for, uh, but it's just not practical. You know, I come from a department where if we're fully staffed, we have eight members on duty. We do our own EMS. Uh, and so at any one time, there could only be two or three guys left uh, back in the station if we have two ambulance calls. So the, the minimum standards are great, but you know, for large cities where they have the staffing and then the, the budgetary uh, capabilities for, but when you come from a smaller community like I do, it's just not going to happen. All right. Uh, so that's kind of how I feel, but let's, let's, let me take devil's advocate for a minute. So are we, how do we get ourselves in trouble? And I'm going to throw that back to Warren. Um, do I think this is Pete's, you know, Pete's perception, which is, we all know is a little clouded, but Pete's perception is this. We often hear the terms, we don't have enough staffing. I'm going to put it right out here on the front end of the panel, and please, somebody can argue with me if they want. It's okay. I got the button. I can shut you off. It's okay. Feel free to say anything you want. But <laughs> the the point I have is this. It is the incident commander's responsibility to get the right number of people there to perform the tasks they're trying to perform. We can throw up our hands all day long. We can say I'm supposed to have 17 to 22 people here. I'm supposed to have a four-person truck company. But the fact is, if I don't, then I think I've got to make some realistic expectations about what a company can achieve. So, uh, Chief Whitley, what are, what are you thinking? What what can be achieved, or or what what do you think the issues are here? That was my my two cents on that. But what are you what are you thinking? Well, part of it is, and you know, you and Joe and I have had this discussion, Joe Starnes, who killed the flashover, is what can we do to make the fire not grow while we're waiting on help? So how can we decay the fire? Um, so one thing we can do that we should do on every fire, regardless if you have 55 people or two, is do a good size up. Do that 360 and see what's really going on. So if you only have, let's say two guys show up on a pumper and the front door is open, letting air into that fire, you know, they're perfectly capable of going up and closing the door while they do some other stuff. Like, let's bring a hose line with us to the wherever the fire might be. Because we've discovered you can do a whole lot of knockdown from the exterior and not put yourself in any danger. And if there is a victim in there that you can't go search for yet, um, you're at least making it more tenable for them while you get your two in, two out taken care of or um waiting on further information to see if you have a location where you can safely take a peek so so you're suggesting that i close the door and trap additional toxins in where those civilians are and then you want me to apply water from the outside and possibly cause steam injuries is that what i heard you say or was i not hearing the right thing oh no <clears throat> You heard the right tactics, not the right results. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm being facetious there. I but, know that. Um, you know, the, some of what just came out of Chief Whitley's mouth is, is blasphemy. And I got to tell you, in the first 20 or 30 years of my career, it was blasphemy to me also um, until, we, until we figure out that, you know, knocking down the fire, knocking down visible fire is not a bad thing. 
So, um, Chief Ling, let's talk about some of the things. And, and you have a story that you've said on a previous roundtable, but I think we ought to revisit it now at this point with the, with the extinguisher story. But uh, also just reaching out to folks that are uh, watching live on YouTube. If, you, if you've got a question or a comment, throw it in the chat room. We'd be happy to, uh, happy to answer it if we can. So, uh, Chief Ling, uh, what, what do two people do or three people do? Uh not to be repetitive i'll just refer to we need to do exactly what chief whitley said because it, it works it absolutely works i i don't think there are I, i'll actually make a note of this that someone agreed with chief whitley because that doesn't happen every afternoon so i think <laughs> i think we'll actually uh, uh mark that down didn't you have an experience, uh, Chief, with a uh, with a dry cam extinguisher at one point, just single handedly? I think that story needs to be told on this on this roundtable. Uh, yeah, I did, and it was um, it was something that I learned at a Kill the Flash over burn in in North Carolina, and I was first due at uh, a structure fire, um, residential two story private dwelling. When I arrived, um, front door was open, door to the fire room was open. Um, and it was that time of the morning where crews for me are a little dicey. It was about 5 30, 6 o'clock in the morning. I was the I was I happened to be up. I was out the door right away. I was there quickly. And uh, when the dispatcher starts asking me what I want to do because I don't have an engine on the road at X amount of time, I know I'm gonna be there by myself for a while. So I went in, I shut the door to the um, bedroom that was on fire, that was heavily involved. The fire was just starting to make itself out of the bedroom, and it was starting to crumb down the hallway. I closed the front door of the building as well, went back around, um, was going to actually do my 360. I went in and I shut the doors first because I knew the fire was staring me in the face when I walked up to the house. I knew where it was. But I noticed that there was a little pane of glass on the uh, fourth side of the building, or the D side for most of the world, fourth side if you're in New York. Um, a little piece of glass that was missing out of a window. And I, I remembered at that point, my truck was right there. I was like, hey, you know what? I should really try dry chem in this thing. So I went to my truck and I got a little tiny dry chem and I expelled the thing inside the, the fire room through that little pane of glass. And um, just like Laws Augustrand taught me at Kill the Flash Over, I put the entire room of fire out. And I bought all that time um, for the engine to show up. By the time the engine stretched and was making it down the hallway, um, that window had actually failed. And then we were back right off to the races, but the guys had the line in place already. And if I hadn't done that, I hadn't controlled the door. Um, I hadn't stopped the fire in that room. That window would have probably failed way before the engine showed up and the fire probably would have been up and across the attic by the time we got water on it. Yeah. And, and you've told that story and I think that it, it bears mentioning. Now, listen, there, there could be a hundred people watching right now and, and full disclaimer, well, you know, nobody should have been there by itself. We should have had the, you know, full staffed engines. We, it, you know what, there is a ton of coulda, woulda, shoulda. And, and I think that your actions were prudent. I think you were taking a, a, a risk that you thought that you could, you could take. Um, you, you based it on some experience that you had. And I think, you, I think the term that uh, Joe Steins uses is, did you favorably influence the situation? You know, Absolutely. Warren took Absolutely. it from the other side. Absolutely favored that situation. Right, right. Warren took it from the other side and said, you know, let's not make it get any worse. Let's prevent it from spreading. Let's prevent it from getting worse. Or you could look at it. Did your action favorably? I could have chose to do nothing. I could have chose to sit, sit on the front lawn with one hand on my radio and basically do nothing. And with the room to the fire, uh, the door to the fire room being open and the front door being open, we would have had a house full of fire by the time the engine showed up. Right. Right. Robbie, what are your thoughts? What does what does minimum manpower do? And I'd like you to talk about the series of articles you just wrote as it relates to uh, 
a single company searching kind of thing. Uh, we don't have time to do the whole thing, but talk about what can this minimum company do safely? Well, when you reference that too, what those, I guess, I guess articles, if you want to call them, or just random thoughts I've written down came from a situation where I was responding to a fire in my very well-staffed uh, fire department. I mean, especially for a, a small, you know, what we would call a ranch on, house on fire. We're sending four engines, a medic unit, two chiefs, two special service companies, which is either a ladder truck or a rescue. So we're getting, while we only ride with three, I mean, we're sending a ton of people uh, to a to a you know a, a report of a fire. Uh, so we we got a lot of manpower. But as we're as I'm going to this fire, I get a call from the battalion chief going, "Hey, this company's coming from here. This company's coming from here, and all the battalion chiefs are coming from here. So you're going to be by yourself for a while." Okay, which is kind of rare in our department. You know, it, we're, we're a smaller county and we have 21 stations. So immediately you're kind of thinking priority. You know, I, I use. Uh, Jocko Willink and Leif, and, uh, Leif Babbins prioritize and execute. I'm arriving on an engine. What can I do? For me, the best thing that I can always do is put that fire out from wherever that location is. Uh, if I can go inside and put it out as fast as I can, awesome. If I, can, if, if I have to hit the fire from, from outside first, then go in and kill it, awesome. I, I want to put the fire out as fast as possible. But someone still has to search. So we did what I wrote about in that ranch house search is – stretched to the fire and then once we had a line in place on the fire i started searching the rest of the building so that we could until we got other resources there and i ended up searching a good portion of it and we were in a rescue mode situation we pulled up front doors wide open no occupant accountability outside and uh so we went to work went into a rescue mode um with with our minimum staff and driver officer firefighter and in that situation, you know, I have to be a working supervisor. So I have to be in charge of the fire and then I have to make, you know, make decisions and, and do those things. Um, as far as what a company can do uh, safely, I think you have to play into you. Sometimes you have to get creative, but you have to play within what you're dealt. Uh, you know, size up your situation, like Chief Whitley said, prioritize the most important things and then execute those tasks. Don't try to overwhelm yourself uh, and keep it simple. When you try to keep things simple, that's, uh, you know, when you're in a low manpower situation or when things go bad, the simpler you're trying to do things, the better they are. Well said, Robbie. Well said. I think, you know, for years we've all been taught and I got a room full of books over here and bookshelves full of coordinated fire attack. Right. That's that's a term that we've all heard, you know, take the line in, ventilate at the same time, coordinated fire attack. I think what happens in the rural world or the smaller department world or, or in any cases, as we've pointed out here on the panel, the fact is you may have to do sequential fire attack, not coordinated fire attack. And, and I think that's what you just described, Cap, is, uh, is sequential fire attack, picking, picking the priorities. So uh, we've got a bunch of folks watching live on YouTube. If you are watching live, feel free to uh, leave a comment and uh, we'll be happy to jump in and interact with you if we would like. Um, Chief LaPierre, what, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, you've heard with some of the other folks. Uh, give us your perspective if you can. Oh, um, <clears throat> I, uh, um, I, I agree with everything everybody's saying. Uh, you can't argue with the science. Um, uh, if there are things that we can do to influence the environment of the structure uh, prior to personnel arriving on the scene and the things that we're going to do are going to make the environment better. Um, why wouldn't we do it? Uh, uh, and that's kind of the way we run in my community is, you know, uh, we're always understaffed. Uh, we, that first unit gets on the scene and declares that you know they have a, a structure fire our second alarm assignment is going to get those numbers up to 1710 um but most of the time our work is finished before those resources arrive on a scene and right. i agree with i agree i coordinated is wonderful but sometimes coordinated is disney world sequential is, is usually you know one or two companies basically trying to get everything done in a short amount of time Absolutely. Chief Cagno, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I like the sequential word. Um, if you add uh, realistic to that, you, you know, um, and go back to everything 
everybody else is saying, if we make it uh, se sequential and realistic, we're, you know, we're matching expectations based on what we have, um, you know, obviously you can change the dynamics of what's going on. And, uh, and that's what we have to do when we're short staffed. Um, even in, a, in a, the, a community that has sufficient manpower, um, you know, everybody's not arriving in that preferred se sequential order. So, you know, you, you pull up to the unusual, maybe, uh, you know, you don't got the tree decker tonight, but you got the commercial building, you know, as a, uh, incident commander, you got to tell your people to act smart. They can't go, you know, a hundred feet into that building. They maybe can only go 30, um, <clears throat> so you, you got to be realistic and, and you got to do it sequential. All right. Makes sense. Chief Pernesti, what are you thinking? Well, <clears throat> I think the other issue as far as like what Chief Cagno is saying is, is true. But if you're going to have a light staff as an incident commander or a light staff on arrival, um, you need to be a very good forecaster and know where that fire is going to be in five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes and get what little crews you have to maybe cut off the fire or just put a hit on the fire, get water on the fire, however you can, inside, outside, on top of, whatever. Um, where I put in the comment section, we maybe talk about it later, where I get disgusted is, uh, and where we get people hurt, uh, is when we try to apply uh, 17, 15, 17 men to a commercial building fire. And because that's what we do day in and day out with a residential structure fire, that's where we're getting people hurt and killed, I think, is arriving when and doing, you know, tactics and, and personnel based on a residential with a, a, a commercial building. Okay, makes sense. Um, Captain Tebow, what are you thinking about this conversation? What are you thinking we can do? Uh, what are your thoughts on, on, well, you've done this. I mean, you've certainly responded this way in your own community. Uh, what are you, what are you telling those first two, uh, two man or three man companies to do? Well, our SOPs, uh, specify what everybody is going to do. So we train heavily on the SOGs and the SOPs so that when we do have an incident, everybody knows what they're doing. Uh, as far as attacking, you're right, and to what everybody else has said, uh, it's not going to be a coordinated attack because when you show up with uh, four guys on one pumper or between a pumper and an ambulance, you know, we take care of life safety first. And then, uh, as it was pointed out, sometimes the best thing you can do is put the fire out. And how you put it out is whatever's going to be safest for everybody. Uh, as we all know, everybody will, we, every, as the incident commander, and I'll be the initial incident commander, you know, my job is to make sure everybody goes home at night. Uh, we didn't put our guys into this position, so I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to go uh, out on a limb to save nothing. Uh, but we will, you know, if we tackle from the doorway or a couple feet in from the doorway, we'll do everything we can to at least minimize the damage. Uh, to the best of our abilities until we get those mutual aid companies. For us, a mutual aid companies, you know, could be anywhere from 10 to 12 minutes away. So we have some time that we're going to be there. We can't, uh, we can't sit there and wait for them to show up and not do anything. Yeah, I think, I think that's part of the discussion. I mean, we have an obligation to the citizen. Um, you know, we do have an obligation to attempt to save lives. I mean, that's what we're here for. The truck still safe fire department. But at some point, I think the commercial conversation is one. I mean, at some point, why don't I be devil's advocate and say, listen, my city should have had more firemen. We've been telling them we need to recruit more volunteers. We can, I, I'm not going to do anything until I have 22 people here. I think the argument becomes, I don't think you're doing anything for the citizen at that point either. That's not the time to make that political statement. I don't think, I mean, that's just me. That's, uh, I got a different system, but you know, people, well, we should have a fully staffed fire department. We should have the right stuff. I, I, I get it. I get it. I've had those fights in town halls. I've, I've fought those battles in town halls, but I don't think that it, it, it translates all across the country. And we have a bunch of folks in Canada that are smaller departments or what have you. I just don't think that that argument translates very well um, some of the things we described, let me ask you, is some of the things we described, um, did we take unsafe actions? Did we take risks 
to do some of what we said on the panel. And what are you thinking? Was it an acceptable risk or was it not an acceptable risk? Well, in fact, I don't even know what, what is an acceptable risk? Chief Whitley, what are you, what are you thinking about that? Well, we could go back to Bruno's definition of, you know, um, if you have a something risk a lot to save a lot, risk a little to save a little. Um, but it's interesting, my little cohort of alumni from the EFO program we met this weekend was the symposium up in Emmitsburg. And we always sneak off and have our little seven or eight member full session. So one of the guys started this this time with LIP. You know, how, what's, what are our interpretations of life safety, incident stabilization, and property conservation, and are they in the right order? So one of the, my part of the discussion was, well, we don't, we overemphasize life safety at the neglect of incident stabilization. The property conservation, you don't even argue that with me. If it's just property, I'd just soon let it burn. No way there's no risk. But so we were discussing on, what is the acceptable risk you know if, if we are, can confirm there's a victim inside well we're going to go do everything we can to try and get them but we need to mitigate as much of the risk as we can with the proper use of science and tactics cutting off the air putting water ahead of us using our tick to help find the fire and the victim um, and not making it worse while we're going in there trying to locate who it is we're looking for. Too often we see these uh, hot rich firefighter induced flashovers because they're breaking every freaking window. We're leaving the door open while they're masking up. They're, they're doing nothing to decay the fire while they're getting ready to do a tactic. So I think in that case, they're, they're not emphasizing life safety either for themselves or the victim by making bad decisions and being in a hurry. You know, we'll steal from Joe again, it's starting with the tactical patience mantra he uses. Think about what you're going to do and what the impact's going to be, whether that impact is right now or somebody else mentioned five or ten minutes from now. So, personally, I'm not going to risk anything for just property if I know it's just property and it's getting away from us. You know, there's no exposures, no victims, no nothing. Again, it comes back to we had the discussion uh, again, this weekend on why do we put out dumpster and car fires when there's no exposures? And the only answer these guys came up with, because we always have. You know, one of our business, biggest exposure problems for our life safety is all the carcinogens produced by those two events and a lot of the unknowns that might be in the dumpster. So I rambled. No, that's all right. You're, you're good, good for rambling. A question from the chat room from Joe Steins, actually, who is lurking out there. Um, does anybody, I'll just put it out there generally to any of the other viewers or any of the panel members, if you want to contact Joe, he's looking for an SOP for five to 10 firefighters in the first 20 minutes. Does anybody have a tight uh, SOP based on five to 10 people in the first 20 minutes? So thank you, Joe, for that. We'll put that out and see if anybody bites. Uh, Robbie, you got, uh, you got something you want to chime in here. Oh uh, yeah. Just, you know, when you were talking about risk, I had to put this on Twitter the other day and it uh, was a quote from John Paul Jones, who basically said, you know, if someone who doesn't risk anything has no chance of winning. Uh, and, and I think that's important when we realize what we're here to do. You know, I, I, and again, you know, I want to, you know, you want to manage all the risk. We need to. It is our job to mitigate the risk down to as little possible as we can. But there will never, ever, ever be zero risk in this job, ever. Everything that we do, even by starting when you get the call, by getting on the fire truck and racing to the call, uh, you're, you're, you're putting your, your life in someone else's hands because of people texting and driving and doing all this other stuff. That may be one of the riskiest parts of our job, you know, before you ever get to the fire. But there will never, ever, ever be uh, a no-risk scenario in our job, and I think we need to accept that. Manage, gather all the information you can, manage that risk down, and then you have to go. You have to, we, we have an obligation to the citizens that we serve to go in there, and if we can, and save their life, if we can save their property, okay, um, you know that's that's fine. That's a secondary thing to me as well. 
Uh, but you know, that that's part of what we do. That's part of our job. Uh, to answer the dumpster fire thing that chief Whitley brought out, one of the things that, that, you know, it, not just cause we've always done it, but that whole car and dumpster fire thing, I think in the day's fire service, we have to use that sometimes for to train people to get experience. That may be the first time somebody stretches a line is on that car fire, or that dumpster fire. And that's valuable. You can teach them things. You can say, hey, look, you know, there was a guy, there was a car block in this here. We need to stretch the line around here. That may be the first exposure they have to wear in their air pack in an ideal age atmosphere. So I think with at least in my department where we have plate guys that have been on three years and maybe have never been to a fire, that dumpster fire is important so that we can get those guys, those sets and reps or real life sets and reps outside of training. And that's all I had. Well, yeah, but if you use a deck gun from 50 yards away, there's no exposure hazard. I, I agree with that. I just, but the, no one gets experience that way pulling a line or, or actually getting a, getting a, a fire. I've got a guy that works for me that has been on two years, never worn his air pack in an ideal age. So if that dumpster fire happens, I want him to get his air pack on. I want him to be able to, to gain that experience. Yes, I understand that there's an exposure to all of that stuff, and, and, and I got you, and I understand what you're saying. I just, to me, today, we have to, we have to get experience where we can. We're not coming. I, I'm, I don't live in an urban city and, and where we're fighting fires every day, so I've got to get those sets and reps where we can. That's just my perspective on it. Makes sense. Well said. I, I, you know, I can't even tell this whole story the way I want to tell it, but as a young firefighter, I went to a dumpster fire that someone had thrown in a military yellow smoke canister in the fire, which did not go off until after our arrival. Apparently, I was doing the 100 yard dash faster than anybody had ever seen in turnout gear and boots, but <laughs> as this cloud enveloped me of uh, yellow smoke coming out of the dumpster, but, uh, but I digress. Tell me about this, this, um, how do we train to judge that risk that the, the, because, you know, like I'm, I, I talk about training. So, so here's my question to the panel. How long does it take to, per, you know, if you have a three-man company, somebody's the chauffeur, two people, an officer, and one are going in maybe. It's a standard ranch house. How long does it take two people with an air pack, IDLH, it's not blowing fire, but they're, they're conducting a search in a heavily charged ranch house. How long does that take? Does anybody know? Anybody training on it? I'm not being a bonehead here. I'm just asking a question. Have we, do we know what the capabilities are of that two person crew? Because I think we get into these philosophical discussions of, well, I can do that with two guys and do it safely to a guy and a gal, what is two person crew? I can do that. Well, okay. Suppose they search and then find the victim. Do they have enough air to get out? I mean, I, I don't know, but are we, we talk about managing risk. But are we training and do we know what the benchmarks are to be able to manage that risk effectively? A uh, question to the panel, anybody that's, uh, that wants to dive in, just, uh, just wave on. Well, Rob. Uh, no, go ahead, Joe. Well, I, I, I think in today's fire service, it's definitely got to be slower than what it might have been years ago with experience. I will also say that, you know, I'll be honest with you as an, as a commander of a shift, I'm ashamed to say that I really don't know. And, and that's my fault. I think I, I would hope that my guys would be able to do it quickly. Um, but with VES, VAIS, um, they're trained in that. I would, I would think that they could do that quickly, but you're right. As far as time, I, I think a lot of ICs around the country, including myself could be fooling ourselves thinking it would take, uh, a shorter amount of time than what it really is. And I'll just be honest, I don't have a clue. I mean, it, it's it's so situational dependent. If I have my A team, I'll say a couple minutes, but we don't always have our A team. And that that's not a slight on anybody. No, and it certainly wasn't a slight to the panel because I think it's something we got to talk. You know, how long does it take to make a vertical vent? Um, oh, you know, we can do that in three or four minutes. Uh, okay. Okay, I'll watch. I got I got time. I'll watch you do it in three or four minutes because I think it takes longer than that. I think sometimes, I guess my question is, does the incident commander underestimate the ability of the time it takes to get stuff done? 
And does that have an impact when you only have two or three people there? I, I think it does. I think it does. Chief Cagno. You know, you, you speak about time and, you know, um, often we know roughly how long it takes for our crews to get basic tasks done. But, you know, that that's only up until something happens. For example, uh, you, you know, they, they, they can stretch the line two out of three times and get it, you know, down pat each time. And then on the fourth occasion, you know, there's an obstacle in the way. Uh, the door's a little tougher to force or maybe there's some debris. Uh, it's, uh, you know, a hoarding house or just a, uh, a debris choked hallway or something. So so now it's it takes a little longer. Um, but, you know, Louis, um, Chief LaPierre said something earlier on. He said, he used the word dialogue. And, you know, early on we started some dialogue and a couple of different words came out. Um, um expectations um you talked about sequential order and things like that and i think that's what's important here is that you know meeting expectations and when we talk about what we can and can't do you know there's too many variables and i and i think that we have to go you know take a step back and 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 review the way we, we process things and, and to, to take off on what uh, Joe said, you know, you can't forecast the event with, uh, you know, a good degree of accuracy every time. So whether you, you, you're well-staffed or inefficiently staffed, um, you know, things are going to change. But, you know, I think it, we, we have to agree with what Warren's saying, and, and that is, you know, we need to start taking uh, more consideration towards the risk we take um, versus trying to accomplish things that we know just ain't going to happen. Um, especially if we're, uh, um, you know, task deficient um, early on. All right. That makes some sense. You know, the other thing is, can we do some things safely that'll help us? You know, we talked about that a lot and that is, you know, one of the things I've often thought is once the pump operator charges that line, can that pump operator take a uh, a 14-foot roof ladder off and throw it to, to side B to, to a window by himself? I think he can. If he's, you know, if it's not a thousand foot driveway, I'm saying, but if, if he's within eye shot of the building, he's got his line charged. Is there any reason that he can't maybe do something from a safe position and, and make things better? Um, you know, a simple thing. Question came up, um, Joe, I, I think, uh, Chief Pernesti, I'd ask you to uh, pose the question about your RIT team and a standard ranch house, if you don't mind. Well, I, I'm kind of curious if uh, we're, you're running with, you know, a small amount of people, if you um, hold a three-man company in reserve for RIT, or you put all 11 or 12 or whatever you have showing up in a smaller department right to work in a, let's say, in a everyday bread and butter house fire. To me, if I can get water on the fire and it means that I put my crews, I commit them, I'm going to do that um, safely. I think RIT is a little underestimated, or a little, um, not overrated, but uh, I think the intelligent commander, um, if, if it means a line, maybe two companies on a line to get it where it needs to be and put the fire out, instead of keeping that company in reserve as writ, it could make all the difference. Just a question. I, um, I'm i a little on the fence on that. I think if I got, I can know I can make a hit and use those 11 guys, then I'm going to do that. Um, just curious. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think I get what you're saying. There's no question. Um, I get what you're saying. I guess what, what I've learned later in life and maybe I've just become a little more cautious later in life. And I don't know if that's good or bad or indifferent. I'm not saying that. You know, when is when is the guy on engine two going to have a heart attack? Is it is it going to be in the first five minutes of that fire? Is it going to be in the first three minutes of the fire? Uh, you know, we we know what, and, and I agree. I mean, you got to use your resources. If putting the fire out, I think Robbie said it. I think Warren said it. Uh, Rob Fling said it. If putting the fire out makes this place a whole lot safer, then then let's do it. Let's do it. No question. But you have to bet. And I'm not saying don't do two in and two out for um, 
compliance with OSHA. That don't do it for that reason. The question becomes for the incident commander, do you really believe that someone has the potential to have a medical emergency or bad crap happening within the first five minutes of the incident? And, and, and that's, what, that's what we're doing, right? That's what we're doing. A question from the chat room for the panel, uh, and I think, uh, I think I know at least one person's answer on this. A uh, question from Dan is, do you allow a truck or an engine company to leave the station with driver only? Um, Dan, you might want to say, is that a career situation or a per diem situation, or is that an all-volunteer department? But is there anybody here? Uh, Rob Fling, you're certainly a call uh, situation. Uh, do you allow the vehicle to leave engine or truck with one person? You know, that would be a call I would make after I was on scene as the incident commander. If I had, uh, if I needed, <clears throat> we'll use the op, we'll use the example of an engine in a truck. If I had a driver only for my ladder truck and I felt the need to get that truck there, and I knew I had three engines coming in already that was full cruise, I would probably put that ladder truck on the road and leave the front of the building open because I can mix and match my crews after I get everybody on scene. I could figure it out. Um, but there might be a situation where I feel that I don't need the truck um, because my guys on my engines my department operates a little uniquely we do not have engines we do not have trucks everybody operates as a squad so every piece of apparatus has a full complement of truck company tools as well as um a full complement of engine so can one of my engine guys operate as a truck when i have another two another engine in there extinguishing the fire absolutely i don't have a problem with that um at, but to digress to go back to the beginning would be a judgment call if i had a heavy volume of fire and i knew i was going to have to elevate maybe use a master stream or an elevated master stream i would make the decision to put that truck on the road um with one person is because as long as i get it there i can figure everything out afterwards yeah it depends if you need the vehicle or the or the personnel is what it comes down to and uh, dan did answer me that's an all volunteer department he's talking about is anybody else operating with one person do you allow an, an engine or a truck to go with one person yeah Chief, uh, yeah and the little department i'm work with now it's, it's retirement they do that yeah. yeah, it's it's done more often than you would think it is done, quite frankly. Uh, and what they do is they try to assemble crews at the scene. I think Rob described, that's really what you're doing. Give me the vehicle here and I'll assemble a crew that can, can go after it. Robbie, you wanted to jump in there. Yeah, even in my career department, the companies that have tankers, we don't staff the tankers. It's a piece that's in there. So if we get a call for a response in a tanker district, they'll do what, what I call is a fractured engine company. They'll drop the guy riding backwards and he'll drive the tanker by himself. And then the, uh, so what we do a lot of is nurse operations. So the engine and the, the engine and the tanker will drive down, uh, the driveway park close to each other so that the driver of the engine can pump them both. And then, uh, then the, the guy who drove the tanker there gets dressed out and they try to make a fire attack. Uh, so we do that. That's like a standard thing in my in my fire department. I know in the volunteer days, uh, that would be uh, a, a judgment call again from a volunteer chief officer, like Chief Link said, or the paid battalion chief that was already on scene. Uh, in the part time department I worked for in New Kent County, that was pretty much a regular occurrence. Like sometimes you may be the only guy at the station, so you 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 took it by yourself all the time. Right. Right. I being the NIMS police, I've just notified NIMS that the word you're looking for is tender. Tankers fly in the sky, and I'm just I'm just being a a nitwit here. But uh, see, we can't say tankers anymore. It's tenderest now. Um, Donnie, you got uh, you want to weigh in on this, Captain Tebow? Yeah, I was going to say uh, under a previous administration, our tower truck did roll with one guy. Uh, one firefighter and that uh, it, typically at the scene, he would then uh, join the engine crew that uh, was in that house as well. But 
we got it there just to get the to get the vehicle there and and like uh somebody else pointed out once you get the vehicle there you can always staff it as needed with uh whoever's you know whoever else is on scene but you just wanted the you know it's a toolbox on wheels especially the engine the uh the ladder company Right, right. It depends on what your equipment is. I When I started in the fire department, I was the only paid person on duty during the day. And we had an SOP that no truck left unless it had one man. Um, they were thinking of buying tow vehicles, but, uh, you know, that's the only SOP I never broke in my career, I think. Um, all right, we, we need to begin to start summarizing. So so final thoughts. We We've done a lot of discussion. What are the answers as we, you know, I'll, I'll talk for a couple minutes here and then we'll, we'll kind of run the panel as you want to run the panel. What do we want to say about operating? Let's, let's come up with some solution statements, if you will. Um, can you do something with a minimum manpower? Should you be doing something when you don't have enough people to, to do a fire attack? Um, what, what are some thoughts here as we begin to, to run the panel and make a summary statement as we go? Um, anybody want to dive in or you want me to get, yeah, Robbie, go ahead. Why don't you, uh, why don't you lead off? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that, uh, you should, you know, you should be doing things. If you, even if you have a low manpower, there are things that you can do that are outside the box. Uh, like Chief Ling's, uh, you know, fire extinguisher stuff. There are there's new technology out there uh, with ultra high pressure lines and, and things like that that can maximize uh, minimum manpower. I mean, you're stretching with the UHP line, you're stretching uh, three quarter inch hydraulic hose, and having done it personally, it it, ta- it to me it takes the fight out of firefighting. It's that easy. Uh, you know, putting out a two thousand degree room fire, fully involved, and never breaking a sweat. Um, so yeah, there are things you can do. There are things that you could do. There are slicers, uh, for, or transitional attack, whatever you want to call it. We don't need to get in that debate. That's worse than tanker tender. Um, but, uh, you know, for whatever reason, um, but there are things you could do solutions for it. You have to train with the staffing that you bring to the table. Exactly like what chief Fling said, if you're going to be short, if you know your engines are showing up short, then you need to train with your engine short. Same thing with us. It does me no good to have five people on a hose line in a training scenario when I know I'm not going to have that many people on a hose line in a real incident uh, at, at first. So we need to train realistically. You need to get out there and do sets and reps every day uh, and take advantage of every I – mean, who's not running EMS calls? You need to take advantage of every EMS call. Before I clear it from an EMS call – we measure, we guesstimate the hose stretch. We look at the forcible entry problem. All this is we park like we're going to a fire, not like we're going to an EMS run. So you need to take advantage of all of those things. Train like, like you play. And uh, you, you can do a lot with, with a small amount of people as long as you prioritize and execute those tasks. Nice. Well said. Well said. Uh, Chief Cagno, what are the solutions for operating with, uh, with minimums? Uh, Chief, you're muted right now. Um, absolutely. Uh, the performance has to go on. Uh, we just have to do it smartly. Okay. Um, anybody else? Summary statements as we go. What, what can, yeah, Chief Pernesti, what, what can we leave the audience with as something they've got um, to, to, should they be doing something? What should they be doing and so forth? Well, I, I want to just kind of go along with the same fact that if you only have so many people, you need to train them to be effective, to be effective with that small amount or whatever you consider a minimum staffing uh, and to train on that. Um, also, if you're an incident commander for a small town department or slightly staffed, you need to be, like I said before, a very good forecaster to be able to cut the fire off uh, if, and um and also, lastly, um, consider getting more people on the scene with mutual aid. But there's things that you can do beforehand. Water on the fire is uh, paramount. Yeah, put, putting the, what, that was in Andy Fredericks, I think. If you put the fire out, things get a lot safer sooner. Uh, Deputy LaPierre, what are you thinking? What do we got for solutions? Uh, when the fire department 
when people, when the citizens call, pick up the phone and call the fire department, and we show up on the scene, everything's supposed to get better. <laughs> um, and we should be doing things that improve that situation, you know, and that may, that may, you know, there are, there are a thousand different things that we can do. Wiping out an engine company is not one of them. Um, look at how we can improve the situation, how we can make the, uh, the fire ground safer, how, how we can help that, that, that customer out. If we're running short, get help. Um, less than the time of exposure where we're running short. Um, know what your crew's capabilities are and keep them realistic. Uh, all good stuff. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Chief Ling, what do you got? Uh, what do you got as a takeaway for tonight's show? Um, basically, as it was said, you know, you should be training um, for all different scenarios, short crews being one of them. Uh, I, I know it's probably only m myself that it affects, but most of you guys sound like you ride with three, four guys. For me, a full crew is six guys. Um, if we roll out the door and we're short of that, our SOPs actually change. So we take into consideration um, if we have three, four, five, or six guys on the truck, and it actually changes the way we operate as a company. Okay. So yeah, so that's a, that's a great uh, piece to make your SOP flexible so that you can, uh, you can do something with it, or you've got some parameters. I like to say SOPs are the curbs, right? The right side and the left side, and you give the officer some, some latitude to drive down the middle of the road. Uh, Chief Whitley, what are you thinking? What, what is our takeaway for the viewers tonight? Well, the training piece, I think, is real important and also taking advantage of some of the other technology that some of you have been introduced to, like the smoke blocker curtain, enhanced water, fog nails, and especially a tick can be your friend. Um, I think the big takeaway people should go with is water on the fire from any safe access point makes things better. Yeah, yeah, I think it. I think it begins and it ends with water, quite frankly. And uh, uh, however you can, uh, however you can get it there in whatever direction. I would just say, if you're an incident commander, uh, pay a little attention to how long it takes to complete tasks. Not for you, but for your crews. And and I think uh, uh, Chief Pernesti said something about forecasting. You know, if I know. And I repeatedly, some, some, if you become a shift commander, you kind of stay out of the training room, you stay out of that. And I don't mean you don't get trained, but you're not connected. And so when there are, are timed evolutions or, or repetitive basic company drills going on, you need to have a sense of what that takes. I think somebody made reference to tonight to the A team and the B team. Well, you're never even going to know what your A team is or your B team if you stop looking. So don't get buried in paperwork. Don't get buried in the minutia. The fact is, if you're going to be a good incident commander, you've got to know what that time piece is, what that time piece is. And we, we touched on it at the beginning, but we kind of let it go. How long does it take a mutual aid company to get there? Engine, truck, whatever it is. Uh, I did some training. I did some online training for some folks. They were in Texas. I said, do you have a ladder truck? They said, as we were setting up for the training, they said, no. I said, well, how long does it take you to get a ladder truck? They said 30 minutes. You know what? That, that's a big deal. Maybe you don't need it in 30 minutes. But, um, you know, those are the things that an incident commander has to do. So uh, thank you all on the panel for being here. Thanks for the folks that were in the uh, in the chat room, we appreciate it. We will be back here uh, next Sunday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern, and uh, we look forward to it. I think we're going to have a discussion next week on something non-controversial. I'm, I'm thinking like, well, I don't know. I'm thinking maybe ventilation, something that's a non-controversial subject for the panel. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that next, uh, next Sunday evening. I hope to see you here.